Today we're going to look at what is probably the most absurd way to find the closed formula for the first n natural numbers. And well, why are we going to do this? Well, I think it's kind of a fun exercise and it allows us to use a tool that maybe not everyone knows about, but it, it's a useful tool nonetheless. Okay, so let's start over here with the sum of the first n natural numbers. So we have one plus two plus three dot 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 up to n. And now, well, what I'm gonna do here is take this whole thing and multiply it by x to the n. Okay, and then after doing that, I'm gonna take the sum as n goes from zero to infinity. And so what we're constructing here is something called a generating function. And these are used in combinatorics often to prove that two types of countable objects are the same, maybe without doing a direct combinatorial proof. It's like a generating function type proof. And this is actually done in the number theory that, uh, or the style of number theory popularized by Ramanujan for what it's worth. Okay, so Next up, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write this in a little bit more of a condensed form. So I'm going to write this as the sum as n goes from 0 to infinity, and then the sum as m goes from 0 to n of m times x to the n. Okay, great. And now the next thing that I want to do is switch the order of summation. Okay, so let's make a little bit of a picture over here of how we will do that. So let's get maybe two axes right here. Perhaps this is the M axis and this is the N axis. And observe that N is going from zero to infinity. So that would be like this point right here would be like the point zero. This point right here would be like the point one. This right here would be like the point two, three, four, five, so on and so forth. I'll just stop at five though. But then M is going from zero to N. So that means if N is equal to zero, the largest M can be is also zero. But if N is equal to one, M is allowed to be zero and it's allowed to be one. So that would be like this dot right here. That would be m equals 1, n equals 1. And then if n equals 2, m is allowed to be 0, 1, or 2. And then I think you can see where we're going here. If n is 3, m can be 0, 1, 2, or 3. And now, well, we can fill the rest of this in fairly easily. So notice that we're getting this like triangular shape. Oh, I went off the board there or our picture there, but I think that's okay. Okay, so let's notice that as written inside of our sum, we have this parametrized in the following way. Notice that m, like I said, is going from 0 to n, and then we have n going from 0 to infinity. But what we'd like to do is change this order of summation like I just mentioned. So how can we do that? Well, we want to find a bound for n that's in terms of m. That being said, m will now go from 0 to infinity. Because notice that m is getting infinitely large at some point way over there, and it starts here at 0. But notice that the smallest n is, well, what is that? Well, notice that here n is equal to zero. Here the smallest n can be is one. Oh, but that's m. On this line, the smallest n can be is two, but that's equal to m. So n is ranging from m up to infinity. Okay, so that's the way that we will change the bounds of integration. Oh, I said change the order of integration, but Summation and integration are really kind of the same. So that was a slip up, but it's kind of the same idea. Okay, so let's do that. So now we have the sum as m goes from zero to infinity. And then inside of that, we have the sum as n goes from m up to infinity. But we're still summing the same stuff, m times x to the n. Okay, great. 
But now let's observe what this object right here is. So let's maybe put a little underline here and maybe we'll put a star here to talk about what this object is. So observe that it's a geometric series and well, what's the start term? So I'll just say the starting term. Well, the starting term is what we have when n is equal to m. So the starting term is in fact m times x to the n. But then what's the common ratio? Well, I think you can pretty easily check that the common ratio here is simply x. If you take one term and divide it by the previous term, you'll, you will get x. So let's maybe box this off and now we'll use the geometric series summation formula for, well, this bracketed pink underline. Okay, so now we've got the sum as m goes from zero to infinity. So recall the formula for the sum of a geometric series is the starting term over one minus the common ratio. So m x to the m all over one minus x, starting term over one minus common ratio. And now here you might be worried about convergence and stuff. And if you're worried about convergence, you could just take the absolute value of x to be less than one throughout this argument. That being said, generally when we're using generating functions for these types of combinatorial arguments, x is considered to be something called a formal variable. And so we'll simply apply these rules and well, we're not even thinking about convergence. All of this is happening formally. Okay, great. But now let's observe that we can factor some stuff out of this. And in fact, I'm gonna factor an x over one minus x out of this. And that's so it'll look like something that's kind of helpful. Okay. So like I said, we're gonna factor an x over one minus x, and then we'll be left with the sum as m goes from zero up to infinity of m times x to the m minus one. But let's look carefully at this right here that I have the peach underline and observe that it looks like a derivative has occurred. And that's in fact exactly why I pulled this x out so that my exponent would be one less than my coefficient. And here I'm just gonna write, maybe this isn't super necessary. The derivative with respect to x of x to the m is equal to m times x to the m minus one. So let's maybe box this off. And that's what we're gonna use to make our next step but we're kind of running out of room here. So let's open up a little portal. We'll put an equal sign here and then bring it up here. Okay, so again, with this peach underline, I could replace this with the derivative with respect to x of x to the m, but I'm gonna bring that derivative outside. Again, if the absolute value of x is less than one, everything absolutely converges and you're allowed to bring the, uh, the derivative outside in the language of formal calculus or the formal calculus of these generating functions, you're also just allowed to bring it outside as well. Okay, so that's gonna leave us with x over one minus x, and then we'll have the derivative with respect to x of the sum as m goes from zero up to infinity of x to the m. Oh, but check it out. Now we've got a geometric series again and well, it's a really simple geometric series. It's a geometric series where the common ratio is x and the starting term is one. So we know exactly what that sums to. So now we have x over one minus x and then times the derivative with respect to x of one over one minus x. Okay, nice. But this derivative, with, but this derivative with respect to x of one over one minus x is said to be best friends with the function one over one minus x squared. And that's because, well, the derivative of one is another. 
Uh, and I think maybe black pen, red pen uh, says this best friends about these two functions. I think it's a nice little joke, if you will. Okay, so that derivative, like I said, is one over one minus x squared. Multiplying that in will give us x over one minus x all cubed. Or in other words, we'll have x times one minus x to the minus third. Oh, but now what we're gonna do is use binomial expansion on that one minus x to the minus three. So that's gonna leave us with x, and then we'll have our sum as n goes from zero up to infinity of minus three choose n times x to the n. Sorry, not x to the n, minus x to the n. Again, that's just a binomial expansion formula where we have an exponent of minus three. Okay, so now let's use the formula for that binomial coefficient. So here we'll have x, then our sum as n goes from zero up to infinity, and anything choose n is a descending product starting at whatever that is, going down n terms over n factorial. So that'll leave us with minus three times minus four the last term will be minus n minus two, and then this is all occurring, like I said, over n factorial, and then we'll also have a minus one to the n times an x to the n. But now let's observe that there are exactly n terms in the numerator, but all of them are negative. So we could in fact factor a minus sign out of every term here in the numerator and cancel it with this minus one to the n that we also have. We also have from branching it off this minus x to the n. Okay, so let's see what that leaves us with. So that's gonna leave us with the sum as n goes from zero up to infinity of n uh, plus two times n plus one all the way, or maybe like times n all the way down to four times three and then this is all occurring over n factorial. And then, well, what do we have left over? We have an x to the n plus one. Oh, but now notice that we almost have an n factorial in the numerator. We've got this descending product starting at n, ending at three. If we simply multiply this by two in the numerator and the denominator, then this object right here completes to an n factorial, which will cancel with this n factorial in the denominator, leaving us with n plus two times n plus one over two times x to the n plus one. Okay, well, the next thing that we wanna do is re-index this. So in fact, we're gonna re-index this by sending every n to n minus one. So technically that means our new sum will start at one because when n minus one is equal to zero, n is equal to one. Okay, so let's see what that, where that leaves us. So now we'll have the sum as n goes from one up to infinity. This n plus two will turn into an n plus one because we're replacing n with n minus one. This n plus one will turn into an n. Again, we're replacing n with n minus one. And then we've got a two in the denominator. Maybe changing the order, that gives us n times n plus one over two, and then we have an x to the n. And then very, very last, what I'm gonna do is notice that if n is equal to zero, this coefficient disappears, so I might as well change this one to a zero. Oh, but now look at what we've done here. We started over here with this sum of these first n natural numbers within this power series. And over here, we have the same sort of power series in x with this n times n plus one over two, but two power series are equal if and only if all of their coefficients are equal. Well, what does that mean? Well, this is the coefficient of all of these over here, and this sum of the first n natural numbers is the coefficient of what we started with. So that means these two green boxes must be equal, but that's just the familiar formula for the sum of the first n natural numbers. And there we have it. So is this an absurd, ridiculous way to prove this? I think probably so. 
Do you know any other kind of ridiculous ways to prove well-known mathematical identities? If you do, post them in the comments. And that's a good place to stop.